And here on Cobb Sports TV, we have a special guest with us. As you see, the reunion night is coming up for the Virginia Squires this Friday at the Portsmouth Renaissance Hotel. And we are pleased to be joined by the former Virginia Squires ABA All-Star. He spent four years with them, of course. It all started for him in the state of Pennsylvania before he came to the Commonwealth of Virginia and started Old Dominion University and ODU Sports Hall of Famer, a Virginia Sports Hall of Famer. And he is none other than Dave Twardzik with us, won an NBA championship as well in 1977 with the Portland Trailblazers. How are you, my friend? Good to see you. I'm doing well, Matt. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And I've also had the privilege to call a few Old Dominion men's basketball games with this guy uh, filling in for Ted Alexander. Well, uh, let's start there before we get to the Squires and your entire wonderful basketball odyssey. How was uh, life the year away from the microphone? You've been involved with the sport, and you still are, of basketball at various levels for so many years. But how was the year away from the microphone? Well, you know, Matt, it was not an easy decision to walk away from that. I, I truly enjoyed it. I can't believe I did it for 10 years. Um, but the commute, we're living down in North Carolina, a little bit outside of Pinehurst. And the commute's over four hours to get up there and, I'd leave Wednesday so I could watch practice Wednesday afternoon, play Thursday, practice Friday, play Saturday, and we rarely had a an afternoon game, so I had to spend Saturday night. I'd be on the road 6 o'clock Sunday morning to get back home. I'd get back to the house about 10.30, 11 o'clock, and at my age, I need about two naps to recover from that, so it shot Sunday, too. It, it consumed five days of my life. So uh, I made the decision in June. I, I talked to Wood and uh, told him, I said, Wood, I, I loved it. Thanks for the opportunity. But um, it's just too much on me. And it's worked out great. I, I have listened to some of the broadcasts and uh, I, I continue to follow the team. Outstanding. And uh, we'll maybe even get your thought before we go here on the new man taking over. They go from one Jones to the other and uh, Jeff Jones retiring. Mike Jones, an ODU grad, taking over. But uh, let's get to it this Friday night. Big event in Portsmouth here in the Commonwealth. A Legends Hold Court in Portsmouth. You see it there on our screen. The Renaissance Portsmouth Norfolk Waterfront Hotel. Join all of us as we welcome in Dr. J. Julius Irving, George the Iceman Gervin. James Jumbo Eakins, Neil Johnson, Dave Twardzik, Charlie Scott, and so many others for the 70th annual PIT, commencing with the PIT uh, next week, but this Legends Holding Court event before the Portsmouth Invitational Tournament, saluting the legendary Virginia Squires. Uh, I know you all have had reunions before, but as we all watch time go by, it's, it's getting like this might be maybe the very last one. Tell me about uh, what you think of this, and I'm sure it rekindles so many fond memories and moments that you had. Yeah, it really does. The Squires have a very fond place in my heart. I, if it wasn't for the Squires, uh, there's no telling how long I would have been able to play. It gave me an opportunity to uh, continue playing basketball after my career at Old Dominion, which I never thought growing up I would have a chance to do. So uh, it's going to be good to see. Uh, I, I've never really stayed in touch with a lot of the former teammates, but uh, anytime I would see George Gervin or, or Doc or Jumbo, like no time has passed at all we kind of pick up right where we left off many years ago so i'm excited to see them and for you and we'll get through this uh the journey with the squires in a moment but i mentioned it started for you in pennsylvania and if i'm not mistaken dave correct me if i'm wrong uh you played at middletown pennsylvania state championship team was it 1968 yeah it was in 68 that's and, and you beat people, was it by 34, 35 points per game? You were an awesome team before you were part of some teams with the Squires. Actually, Old Dominion went to a national championship, Squires, and then won a championship in Portland. So you were part of a heck of a high school team before this whole college pro thing even started for you. Yeah, Matt, we were actually a very good team. I was from a small town, about 8,000 people, and, and typical small town where athletics kind of drives everything, and that's the, the bonding compound for the entire – the little town. So to be a part of that, uh, we were really good. Uh, we didn't have anybody that dominated. Uh, we ended up, won our first game, lost our second game, and then won 28 in a row. We were, there were three classifications in high school. We were the middle one, class B, the second largest, and or the second smallest, however you want to spin it. And we lost our, the, the team we lost to was, uh, in the largest category, and they went to the state semifinals. 
but uh, the teams we beat, our average margin of victory was 35. And, and Matt, we beat some teams by 50 and 60 points. We'd have over 100, and the other team would have 40. So we pressed, we ran the fast break, and that was just our, our existence. And we shared the basketball. Again, there was nobody that dominated, averaged over 15 points a game, but we just had tremendous chemistry. Well, I imagine for you, it, it was like uh, hand fitting into a glove. What a great transition to play for the late great uh, Sonny Allen, who long overdue, as you and I have talked about uh, off air, got that call to the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame not too long ago. But as you transition from high school to college and you come to Norfolk, Virginia, probably didn't even know where Norfolk was on the map. Tell me how that all came about. And then getting the old Dominion, could you have ever envisioned what would take place for you? ODU, Squires, NBA, Portland, career as an executive and everything that's transpired since. Matt, you're exactly right. I, I had no idea where Old Dominion was. I'll show you how smart I was. I didn't even know Old Virginia was the Old Dominion state, but uh, Sonny, I played in a local all-star game and it was kind of like the best of Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Portsmouth playing the best of Hampton uh, and the Peninsula teams. So it was a small all-star game, and I can remember walking to my car afterwards. It was about 30 miles from my house uh, where we played, and uh, walking to the car, and this gentleman comes up, introduces himself as Sonny Allen from Old Dominion College, and I'm thinking, I had never heard of Sonny Allen, and obviously I was a basketball fan, followed college basketball, and never heard of Sonny before, never heard of Old Dominion, and I thought please just let me get to my car and go home. And Sonny said, you know, I really like the way you played. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Old Dominion and our style. We're in the southeast corner of Virginia, and we are a fast break team. We, uh, we run the ball make or miss, and you would be our point guard, and you would, make, you would have the ball about 80% of your time. Now that starts to get my attention a little bit. And uh, he said, what I'd like for you to do is uh, fly down to see the school and uh, spend a couple days and, and a visit. And I thought, well, I've never flown before. Another reason to get my attention. And Sonny said, yeah, we could fly you down on a Friday, spend, you, spend Saturday, Sunday, and fly you back Monday. The biggest thing was I was going to get out of school Friday and Monday to, 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 for this visit. I told Sonny, I said, Coach Allen, I've heard a lot of great things about Old Dominion. I'd love to come down to see the school. And, Matt, that was my only four-year scholarship. And when my father heard four-year scholarship, he said, David, you will love Old Dominion College and, and Norfolk, Virginia. And he was right. Well, I want to stop there for a second because, you know, I've, I've covered high school sports and recruiting for 20-plus years now, and it's changed so much with NIL, the transfer portal. Yeah. I know you've been a little bit outspoken on airwaves about that and have some thoughts, but to only have that scholarship four-year opportunity nowadays, it's it's so different because it feels like high school kids, unless you're that top 50, top 100 kids, so many Division ones are turning the page to the portal. But secondly, it's pretty rare back then and nowadays. So, I mean, have you looked back at it, given some thought post playing career about, man, this was just right time, right place, right situation. It was almost like it was destiny, if you will. Well, I look back on my career, everything. I was in the right place at the right time. Most of the time, um, one to get the opportunity to play college basketball at old dominion. And then when I think it was my junior year, the Squires moved down from Washington. Scope was not done at the time. Hampton was not done. They played at the field house on campus. And I actually worked for the team. I was a stat runner. So, Matt, if you were doing the games or if you were covering the games during timeouts, I'd be shuffling along, giving you stats and giving everybody stats uh, along press row. So, uh, again, right place at the right time. And then when I got out to Portland – we had so many, so much turnover. There were seven new players on the team uh, my first year out there. We had a new coach. Lenny Wilkins was fired. They hired Jack Ramsey. I didn't know anything about Portland. Um, I've obviously followed the NBA, but I wanted to stay in the ABA because, one, 
Virginia was based in Norfolk, and I never thought we would leave Norfolk, Virginia. We absolutely loved it. And, and the style of play was more suited to a smaller guards. It was more up-tempo than the NBA. But going out to Portland, seven new players, entire new coaching staff, which consisted of a head coach and assistant coach, uh, not like today where there's 15 assistant coaches. And everybody was learning at the same speed. So, Matt, I, I look back, I've been so lucky and so fortunate being in the right place at the right time. Well, well, and listen, you're modest about the type of player you were. I want to run to watch you play, but the stories I hear from so many ODU alums and fans and those that checked you out are just legendary to this day. You're still in the record books with some categories. And before you get to the Squires part of, of this, which, which we're going to focus on here in a moment, you know, during Old Dominion, at what point you played a, you played a national championship game, lost to Evansville in 1971, Division II final, you're a two-time All-American. Was there any point or moment, you mentioned about being a stat runner for guys that were broadcasting. It wasn't me back then. It was guys like Bob Costas, so I know cut his teeth, ABA days yeah. then. Uh, was there any moment where you said, you know what, if, if a bounce here, a break here, this might be my chance to keep doing this at one point. Was there any time in your old Dominion odyssey? Obviously, you were all very successful, played for an awesome coach, and you had some good teammates that helped you along the way. But was there any moment where you said, you know what, this might be my ticket? You know, I never realized it. Um... And this will date me a little bit, but we had a freshman team at the time. Freshmen were not eligible to play varsity basketball. So my freshman year, I played on the freshman team, uh, finished that year. I start my sophomore year, and I'm playing behind a guy who was an a, a honorable mention All-American the year before in Dick St. Clair, about a 5'9 point guard. Sonny recruited a lot of players out of the Navy. Dick was out of the Navy, so he was older, and uh, I was playing behind Dick. I, there's no way I was going to beat him out. But the uh, third game of the year, he's in a collision with another one of our players, uh, Harry Lozon. Dick blows his knee out and never really comes back from that. So Dick's misfortune turned out to be an opportunity for me, and I ended up starting the rest of that year as a sophomore and uh, even after that, I, I never thought I would have a chance to play. But uh, after my junior year, Sonny uh, told me that, David, I don't know if you realize, but there were some pro scouts here watching you. And I'm thinking, a pro scout watching me? He said, yeah, you know, you might have a chance to play at the next level. So it was probably after my junior year when Sonny said something to me about the possibility of playing after Old Dominion. Well, I know he, along with the late, great Dr. Jack Ramsey, were two just unbelievable basketball minds that had such a profound influence on you. How much did they help you, even in your post-playing career, Dave, start to look at the game, not just from the, the physical aspect, but the mental, as you've gone into, certainly as an executive in the league, scouting, things of that nature, broadcasting. Did you see it from a different side, from those conversations and being around them and just soaking it up like a sponge, their, their intellect of the game? Absolutely. And they were two totally different types of coaches. Uh, Sonny Allen had uh, a tremendous ability to reduce everything to its most, its simplest terms. Uh, there was nothing complicated with Sonny. He didn't try to reinvent the game with different vernacular. Uh, but you knew there was accountability with Sonny's system. Jack Ramsey was a tremendous X is an O guy. Um, I tell people Jack Ramsey probably forgot more about the game than most of these coaches will ever know. So the contrasting styles, did I take something from Sonny? Absolutely. To try to keep things as simple as possible, but effective and to have accountability. And then with Jack Ramsey, it just continued to be a student of the game. Um, I, and one guy I really learned a lot from out in Portland was the general manager, Stu Inman. Uh, Stu had a tremendous philosophy that character mattered, mattered. and uh, it's not to totally discount talent, but uh, don't ever compromise on the talent of a player. And I kind of carried that through in my when I got into the front office. Uh, 1972, you're drafted by the Trailblazers, but you elect to play for the Squires of the ABA. I guess why? Well, we had been in Norfolk for four years. Um, uh, I had just gotten married. Kathy and I got married right after we both graduated. She graduated a semester before I did in December. 
I graduated in June and we got married in July. Uh, we loved Norfolk. I, I knew a few of the players. George Irvin and I became best friends. But I knew a couple of the players, played against them in the summer when they'd come over to Old Dominion, the field house, to, for workouts. And I, the style of the NBA was totally different than the ABA. NBA had bigger guards. It was more of a slower tempo. But where the ABA, smaller guards pushed the tempo. And it just seemed to fit uh, all those factors why we ended up staying. I think Portland was going to give me a little bit more money over a two-year period. But again, we love Norfolk area and I never thought we'd leave. You get to play alongside Dr. J. Julius Irving. You mentioned the Iceman, George Gervin. How many times in practice, just being around them, did you go, whoa, this is different? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question because my first year in the league, uh, Al Bianchi was a tremendous coach. I've never been around a guy who was a good X and O guy, but his strength was handling personnel. He was, he was incredible. Al could tell you something, and he might rip you up one side and down the other, and it's not like you felt like, well, you know what, Al? You thought I was bad the first half. Well, yeah, we, wait do you see how bad I can play the, the second half. It would be, Al, you're right. And then you'd run through the wall for Al. So with Al, I was playing my first year about maybe 15, 20 minutes a game. But in the course of a game, I'd be sitting there watching, and Doc or Ice would do something on the floor, and it's like, oh, my God, did you see that? Now, the interesting thing is what the fans saw during games was just kind of the tip of the iceberg of how good they were in practice. Because Al's practices, there was some instruction, absolutely. There was some drill work. But Al was big on letting you scrimmage and then correct you during the scrimmage or after the scrimmage. And he would just let Doc and Ice go. And some of the stuff they did, you had never seen before. So it, it was kind of a treat just to be a spectator. Oh, I can imagine that. Do you have, and I know you have countless stories you could go through, probably not even enough time for us to, to go through them all, but do you have one or two that sticks out above the rest of them, favorite time in your Squires days? Well, you know, we had ended up hitting some tough times late uh, my, the, my last two years with Virginia. Uh, but I, I'll always remember just having the opportunity and how excited I was to, to be given the opportunity to try to make this professional team. And we had good fans. We didn't have a lot. I mean, it's not like we sold 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 people in scope. But the fans we had were rabid fans. They loved the team, and it was great interacting with them. You know, looking back at it too, Dave, the, you know, the Commonwealth of Virginia, Norfolk and area, you and your wife Kathy and entire family have become so fond of, uh, it has not had a professional NBA or other professional sports, had minor league sports, has college sports, high school sports, all very big in our area. But do you think it's it, people took it for granted to an extent or just didn't realize just what they were watching at the time, just how special and unique it was? And how about yourself? Did, did, did you look back at it and say, wow, I don't know that we fully all grasped just how unique this was? Yeah, I think, I, I don't know. I, I think you get a little bit jaded once you've been in it for a while as a player and you do realize that it is a business. Um, I remember when I first signed on with the Squires uh, to get involved in the community, Ray Scott, who I think was still an active player, might have been his last year as a player, the year before I got there, he and I went out to, uh, to a store for an autograph session. And Ray at this time was a grizzly old veteran and uh, I, I followed the NBA, so I certainly knew about Ray in the NBA and in the ABA. But Ray painted it a completely picture of, of professional basketball. He, he kind of kept driving home the fact that, hey, this is a business, you know, treat it as a business. And one thing he did tell me, he says, Make, don't ever voluntarily retire. Make them rip the jersey off your back because it's a tremendous lifestyle. When you get chosen to be an all-star in 1975, ABA all-star, what did that mean to you? Well, it's kind of interesting. That year it came down. I, I think there was a, a rule in the ABA that every team had to be represented at the all-star game. 
And uh, it came down to be between George Irvin, who was having a tremendous career or a, a very good year or me. And I don't know why, I don't know if I won the flip or lost the flip, but I ended up going to San Antonio to represent the team. And uh, I always loved going to San Antonio in the ABA and then subsequently in the, in the NBA. It's a tremendous, I love the town. Uh, you talk about rabid fans. Their baseline bums are second to none uh, in, in the league as far as fans go. And to be on the floor with, Doc, Ice, Dan Issel. I mean, that's the cream of the crop. And to get the opportunity to play with those guys, I mean, that's something that I can't remember anything specific about the game other than I did foul out, which I don't know of anybody that's ever fouled out of an all-star game. But but what a treat it was. Not now, Dave. I mean, these days, all-star games, there's, there's hardly any defense. And if you watch oh. the Bucks and Subs of the night, there wasn't a, but like one, two free throws the whole game. It, it's a different game. Oh, it's an absolute joke. I can't watch it. It's so bad. <laughs> it, it, it's so distasteful to me. I, I can't watch. Uh, you know, you broke your leg. Was it the last year of your ABA career? It was, yeah. I played in about uh, 40, 41 games. And then I had a, a, I broke my leg. It was a stress fracture. Take me through that time as you then transitioned to going to the NBA. Portland ended up winning a championship. And my goodness, I don't know if you could have played alongside two more polarizing figures in the sport than uh, Bill Walton and Dr. J, two iconic names in, in basketball, but they were probably total opposites in a lot of ways, right? Uh, opposite in many ways. <laughs> um, Doc was a, as good as Doc was, he had time for everybody. Uh, I don't think he ever turned down an autograph or a picture with people. Uh, same with Ice. Ice was the same way. Um, just interacted with fans tremendously. Bill, on the other hand, was um, he didn't interact with fans well. And when he did, there was a little bit of an edge to him, almost like, uh, well, there was just a little bit of an edge to him. He, he distrusted people a lot. He has changed tremendously. He is so much better nowadays. Um, but as far as those three guys, Matt, there are very few players that can carve their own identity out and put their own stamp on a team or a league. I played with those three guys, Doc, Ice, and Bill. Uh, exceptional talents. Carve their own identity out. I mean, I was, I was a complimentary player. I, I firmly believe that had I gone out to Portland right out of college, I might not have lasted two or three years in the league because Portland, I think, was only in ex existence for two years. They were an expansion team two years prior to that. Expansion team struck. You don't get the cream of the crop when you, you select players from other teams that are unprotected. So... Uh, I don't know if I would have lasted, but I, I was able to go out. My relationship with Bill on the floor was tremendous. Off the floor, you talk about polar opposites. We, we were polar opposites. Uh, I, I'm extremely conservative. Bill's less than, less than conservative. And, uh, but on the floor, there were never any issues. Uh, it's another team. We got along well. We shared the ball well. We didn't care who scored. We all bought into the Jack Ramsey system. So uh, I went from a, a team that really struggled the last two years to a team that everything clicked. And we were actually a, a better team the second year out in Portland. At one point, Matt, we were 50 and 10. And then our backup center got hurt. Bill got hurt. We were without a center. We still ended up with the best record in the league, but uh, we just weren't healthy enough during the playoffs. Well, in addition to this uh, Squires reunion, there's also going to be a uh, part of it, Dave. I know that they're going to have the screening of the documentary about the Squires honoring the memory of Earl Foreman, the owner, Al Bianchi, Fatty Taylor, George Irvin, and so many others. And you mentioned Ice and Doc and Bill Walton. You played with three of the 25 to 50 greatest players of all time in your ABA and NBA career. But I know a lot of folks also got a chance to watch in this past year. I meant to actually – Text you a couple times while I was watching it. The, uh, the 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 long strange trip documentary of Bill Walton and your Blazers team that won the championship. 
Uh, you know, you hadn't won a championship since your your state championship days in high school. You were you were close, very very close at Old Dominion uh, to reach the pinnacle of the NBA sport. I know it's looking back now. We'll be talking here forty seven years. Uh, is that the what? top you, top of the? You, you keep bringing up these years. Like, <laughs> what is up with that? I'm coming up on the fiftieth anniversary of that, which is which is crazy, <laughs> right? And you're going to say, "Oh my gosh!" Yeah. But is, is that the pinnacle of your of your basketball journey? Without a doubt. Uh, anything you do individually pales in comparison. I've always felt it pales in comparison to a, to the, the team success. Um, that's why that's what you're a team. This is a team sport. And uh, certainly people ask me, what's the, the highlight of your career? Obviously winning the NBA championship is. And I think it's uh, it's even sweeter because going from the last couple years with Virginia when we struggled so much to a, an environment out in Portland that I knew nothing about. I didn't know the NBA, I didn't know their personnel very well. It seemed like there was an upheaval because they just got rid of Lenny Wilkins, who was the coach and brought in Jack Ramsey. And we had gone through a few coaches my last year in Virginia. And I thought, Oh, don't tell me it's, I'm going to go through this again. But, uh, it certainly was the exact opposite of that. Are you a believer in that, you know, you have to go through the struggles, the mud to, to reach the mountaintop? Or are you one that says, Matt, I don't buy that hole because of the Squire stunk. It helped me help the Blazers transform. I was alongside Bill Walton, Maurice Lucas, Lionel Hollins, all those great guys. And it was, we were on a great team, great coach. Or do you think some of that actually helped you in your situation in the pros at the NBA level? Yeah, I do. I, Matt, I think, the, the big difference between the ABA and the NBA, the a ABA, we were in smaller markets. We didn't get the media coverage that the NBA did. And back then, it was not even close to what it is now as far as the exposure for the leagues. But if you look at the All-Star team, the first year of the merger, half the All-Star team was ABA. The MVP, ABA, it was Doc. And then you go to the finals, Philly versus Portland, Maurice Lucas, ABA. I was the ABA. Caldwell Jones, ABA. Doc, ABA. McGinnis, ABA. That's pretty good representation and tells you what kind of talent the ABA had. But we just didn't have the exposure. Yeah, it wasn't a situation like we have now with the NFL and these other football leagues trying to, trying to pop up or a, a league challenging – professional baseball the mlb the national hockey league the nba now it was there was so much you mentioned that half half of the all-stars were aba that's that's something that a lot of people don't probably grasp just how good the competition level was and that goes down from what tell me if i'm wrong the management to the coaching and then on the floor talent yeah no i, I would agree i i think if you look at the aba talent it was certainly on par with the nba um was it as deep as the nba uh, maybe not but uh, then you look at complementary players that came in and made contributions to NBA rosters. This is pretty, pretty significant. So the ABA had talent. It's just that I don't know if the owner's pockets were as deep. They certainly didn't have the TV revenue and didn't have the TV exposure. In our remaining time here, I want to ask you, you, you do, you know, years after you're playing as far as coaching, Jack Ramsey, I know, such a huge influence for you. You get into the front office and executive. Uh, you stay involved in the game of basketball. We're an assistant general manager as it's scrolling across the ticket with the Orlando Magic. You, you were a part of drafting Joe Smith from our area, Golden State Warriors, in 1996. Played at Maury High School. Uh, how many times in your, your journey, whether it be playing at the end, got into coaching, then front office, broadcasting, did you get brought up from people, the Virginia Squires days? How much did it get brought up to you? Was it frequently? Was it every now and again? How much did those days of the Squires and, and the folks that just loved those days with you and Ice and Doc and others as part of that memory in their childhood or their fandom as, as a dad, an uncle, a grandfather, you name it? You know, it kind of depended. If you went to NBA cities, mm -hmm. you didn't hear it very often. Okay. But if you went back to ABA cities, you go up to play the Nets, you go to Denver, you go to Indiana, um, you, you hear San Antonio. Those, the four teams that went into the NBA are very, very proud of their ABA tradition. And Matt, professional sports, 
it's really like a fraternity. And then you have sub fraternities within professional sports. You have your baseball fraternity. You have your football fraternity. You certainly have your NBA fraternity. And then there's a sub fraternity in the NBA. It's the ABA guys. We are very proud. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of playing in the ABA playing and playing for Virginia. Uh, so it, it's a, a fraternity within a fraternity within a fraternity that uh, when, when we get together, we're very proud of, of, of what we've done. And with that fraternity too, Dave, when the first ABA team that won the championship, I think it was the Spurs in 99 uh, with David Robinson and Tim Duncan and that group that beat the Knicks in the lockout shortened season. And then we just saw Denver this past year win a championship with Nikola Jokic leading the way. Is there a little twinkle in the eye of you and your, your ABA compadres when a team that was in the ABA wins the NBA championship? In a word, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think you, there's no way you can devoid yourself of the ABA DNA of those franchises and the players. So when they win, I think a lot of ABA players feel pretty good. Sure. Uh, when you, I know you, you, you're not the, the biggest of the NBA fan nowadays and a lot of the, 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 the players that played yesterday are not, but how much did you see in your time playing at old dominion squires? And then you play with Portland. The, the revolution of the three-point shot and the, the fast pace of the game. Did you see it becoming what it has today, or did you not ever envision it getting to the level where we have games routinely, teams shooting 50-plus threes, teams routinely scoring triple digits and playing at such a rapid uh, speed? Because at Old Dominion, that was a big part of your staple, and certainly the late, great Sonny Allen was ahead of his time. I never thought I would see the three-point shot being used or abused as much as it is now. And, and I say abused because I was watching the game the other day, and it was in the fourth quarter. The team on defense, it was about uh, 28 seconds to go. They end up getting the stop, and actually it's a steal with 12 seconds to go, and the team is down two. So now they have a three-on-two fast break. In the old days, or conventional wisdom, run the fast break, score a layup, play five more minutes. It's, it's, you're going to tie the score. The two wings run to the corner, bury themselves in the corner. The guard hits ahead to one of the wings. The guy takes a three-point shot. He misses, and they lose. To me, that makes no sense at all. So I, I think there's a lot of abuse in the three-point shot. Well, it's funny you say that because, and, and so many kids today want to be Steph Curry. They want to take the three point shot. I was just telling a buddy of mine this other day that it's trickled down to the college game where what drives me insane is, and I'm sure it bugs you, but it speaks to what you're talking about. You'll watch a game, it could be college or NBA. A team is down one and they're going for a three at the end of the game to try to win it with the three. <laughs> you're down one. Or you'll see on the break, a guy will pass up a layup, the college or pro. I've seen this numerous times this year, in fact. They will pass up a layup and kick it out for a three. And it's like, wh what's where is the logic in this? Well, there is no logic because it's in analytical stuff. Analytics is driving on maybe all of, all of pro sports now, maybe all of sports. But it is certainly driving the NBA. There are some teams that draft strictly on numbers and analytics. And to me uh, – you can't take the human element out of the draft situation. And exactly what you're saying, how many times have you seen a guy drive, pass up a layup to hit a guy spotting up for a three? It makes no sense to me. You can still win a lot of games making two-point field goals. Uh, a few more minutes to we'll let you run. We appreciate you so much for coming on with us. And, and our time left, what was the biggest thing you learned as an executive? Was it, was it something – that you, you kind of were hinted at from, from Dr. Jack or, or others? And what was the biggest thing you took away from your time, be it Golden State, Orlando, that, that you would pass on to others now that are an executive in the league or just a common fan that may not know it? I think it goes back to what I said earlier about Stu Inman. Don't compromise on the quality of a kid, uh, a person's character. And I, I give the example of you have two players and – they're kind of close talent-wise. But one, you're not quite sure of the one, the best player's talent. Or not talent, but his character. You might get that midnight phone call where, hey, you know, 
uh, Matt was out last night and he got in trouble. He was at this at a restaurant or a bar, got in trouble. Okay. Guys like that have a tendency to break your heart. Uh, I would always err on the side. If the talent is close, I'm going to take the player with the with the best character, the better character. Uh, guys like that will give it to you every night. They won't be a problem off the floor, and they'll give it to you every night on the floor. So don't don't compromise on talent. Or, or on the character of a player. Uh, before we let you run here, I wanted to get your thought on uh, the, the new era for Old Dominion, going from uh, Jeff Jones to Mike Jones in a new day and age for the Monarchs. And I know this is something you said during one of the pregame shows sitting in for Ted with you, that you were the, the portal at NIL was was having a major effect. You're not the only guy saying this in college basketball, but as the Monarchs try to go into this new era uh, in what will be season three of the Sun Belt with Mike Jones and, and try to get back to the level where they're competing for championships. Well, first off, I do not envy any college coach right now. The, the, the portal, to me, is kill, will kill basketball. Uh, and it certainly will affect the mid-majors, I think, more than, than the power teams. Uh, and I, I say that because the mid-major, let's say you find a kid that, for whatever reason, slipped through the cracks. And now, all of a sudden, you invest two years – three years of player development with him. So that's a lot of blood, sweat, tears, and time on this kid. And he develops to become a pretty good player. A, a, a upper major can come in and just take the kid away. So it, it's kind of affecting the loyalty that players had towards the university. I, mean, I look back when I was in school. Now, transferring was kind of a... You never even talked about it, but I never would have left Old Dominion. They gave me an opportunity to play, to get an education. So uh, the transfer portal makes it so tough. Now, I think Mike Jones, with his contacts, with his track record, he's a proven coach uh, following a legend at the Matha and carving out his own niche and becoming a legend in his own right. I think it's a great choice for Old Dominion because of his basketball knowledge, but also because he knows Old Dominion. He's invested in Old Dominion. Now, Old Dominion was invested in him years ago, and he is returning the investment now. I think it's a great choice. Yeah, I know a lot of Monarchs fans are excited about it, and uh, Jeff had a wonderful time at Old Dominion, led him to that championship you were a part of on the broadcast side of things when they won the Conference USA title, fell to Purdue in the NCAA Attorney, but uh, some exciting times look to be ahead. And I will let you go on this note here. Squires coming up, Dave, uh, on Friday night, the reunion. What can what can the uh, audience expect from some of these uh, old timers? They're going to tell some, I'm sure, some stories that have people laughing and also uh, reliving those great memories of yesteryear. Well, I think the lies will be a lot greater now than they were 10 years ago or 40 years ago. But uh, the nice thing about it is. Doc is a great guy. Ice is a great guy. Jumbo and I room together. A great guy. Neil Johnson, a great guy. So you're not only seeing good players, and I didn't know Charlie. Charlie was gone by the time I got there. But uh, all great guys coming back, and it's going to be a good time. There'll be some funny stories. Yep, hors d'oeuvres, screening of the documentary of the Virginia Squires, and they'll be also, as I mentioned, honoring the memory of Earl Foreman, Al Bianchi, Fatty Taylor, George Irvine, going out there Friday. Get your tickets on PortsmouthInvitational.com. Legends holding court in Portsmouth coming up uh, this weekend. Can't thank you enough, my friend. Always a pleasure. Look forward to chatting with you and seeing you this weekend, and uh, all the best to you and Kathy. Uh, all right, Matt. It's always great talking to you, and I will see you Thursday and Friday. There you go. That is Dave Twardzik. Don't forget the Portsmouth Invitational Tournament coming up next week as well at Churchland High School in Portsmouth. Part of our Legends of Sports segment here with us. Keep it tuned to Cova Sports TV. We'll take a time out and hear from some of the great people that make it possible for us right here on Cova Sports TV.